Hello there. In this video, let's derive the work energy theorem for a single particle. This is the simplest notion of the work energy theorem, but still applicable to a wide range of scenarios, particularly, you know, rigid bodies without rotation. And we'll discuss the notions of the work energy theorem for multi-particle systems in future videos. All right, so let's go ahead and suppose that I start with this particle of mass m, and it starts at some initial position. I'm going to go ahead and call this guy here r naught. And what this particle is going to do is it's going to travel along some arbitrary path. I'm going to call this path C, such that the particle is going to end at some location. We're going to call this guy here RF, or R final, okay? So I'm going to call this guy RF. And this particle, while it's moving on this path, could have some force acting on it, okay? And this force, in theory, could change throughout space. It could change with the positions x, y, z, even with time, okay? Right, this is a very general form of the forces that could be acting on my particle. We could even think of this particle as moving through a force field, right? Now, a notational thing on this guy here, you know, there's nothing specific about using Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z, so what we'll sometimes notate is we just take our spatial coordinates here, and we just say this is our spatial dependence r, right? The forces depend on your position and t, right? So you'll sometimes see, you know, your force fields written in this form, f of r comma t. Okay, so now that we're super clear on how I recategorized x, y, and z as r, let's go ahead and show this on the diagram also, right? r is just going to point to, you know, my particle on this curve at any particular moment as it's traveling on the curve, right? And now as this particle moves from one spot on the curve to the next spot on the curve, what's it doing? It's moving some infinitesimal amount dr on the curve. So do we see that? So every time the particle moves along this curve, it's moving some little infinitesimal amount dr to get to its final location, right? Now, as this particle travels along this path C, our forces are going to do work on the particle. Work, let's go ahead and define this now. Work on our particle as it goes from R0 to R final by traveling this particular path C is defined as the path integral of f of r comma t dot dr. All right, a couple things to note here. What's one of the first things that we see? Oh, I have two vectors that are being dotted together in this integral, and they're producing out a scalar. Okay, that makes sense. Dot products between two vectors produce scalars. Very good. Now, what are we really trying to track here by taking account of this dot product of f and dr? Well, let's go ahead and think about this for a moment. So remember that we use dot products to typically reflect, you know, a projection of one vector onto another, right? So let me just go ahead and suppose, right, that I have some force vector f here, and then I have some, you know, some dr vector here, and this is like a finite vector. Then by taking the dot product of f and dr, what I'm really doing is I'm going to ultimately be, you know, finding if this force vector has two components, it's like I'm finding f in the dr direction, more or less, right? And of course, this is actually getting scaled down based on the magnitude of dr, right? Because you're multiplying the two together still, right? dr isn't necessarily a unit vector here, right? But the really important point to make out here is that by taking this dot product, we're ignoring this force perpendicular direction. We're ignoring this. We're saying, I don't care about this. Why don't we care about it? Think about centripetal forces for a second, right? If I'm traveling on a circle, that force that's pulling me inward is responsible purely for changing my direction, not speeding me up or slowing me down, right? So forces that are perpendicular to a path that you're traveling, those are responsible for changing your direction. But the component of the forces that are acting in the same direction that you move, those are the ones that are speeding you up or slowing you down. So you see what we're doing, right? We're using this dot product to find the projection of F onto the dr vector, 
at every location on the curve and then we add those all up together and that's going to tell you something very important, right? It's going to tell you how much those forces are responsible for like speeding you up, right? And we're going to see that more formally that means changing your kinetic energy. So, that, so hopefully that provides you some intuition with where we're going here, right? But we're gonna prove this anyways, okay? So let's go ahead and start modifying, you know, we just take this as our definition and you know, we can see where it leads us. So we have this definition of work. Now what are my forces going to do according to Newton's second law, right? These forces are going to be responsible for accelerating my particle, right? So these forces are going to accelerate my particle. I have m d squared r dt squared. Right, so now if I'm writing the left-hand side of the dot product in terms of a time derivative, let's go ahead and write the right-hand side in terms of a time derivative also, okay? Or more formally, we can think of this as now because we're entering the realm of dynamics, these drs can always be related to a velocity at every moment, right? So my infinitesimal displacements are going to be based on my instantaneous velocity, right? and times the small amount of time that passes, you know, from moment to moment. And that's gonna tell me how I move from place to place on the curve. But now you can see that we've rewritten this path integral purely in terms of, you know, time now, right? Our variable of integration is time here. So this is gonna be the integral now from t naught to t final of m d squared r dt squared dot dr dt dt okay right where where the times t naught and t final are corresponding to my particles initial positions r naught and r final all right now what i want to go ahead and do here is i want to do a little exercise let's look at our integrand here in this box red and i'm going to define this random parameter as my kinetic energy and it is going to be defined as one half m times dr dt squared, right? So now with this definition, what happens if I take the time derivative of my kinetic energy with respect to time? Then this is going to be equal to, what do we have to do? We have to apply the chain rule, right? So first, I'm going to take the derivative of this entire quantity here, with respect to my thing in the square, right? And this is gonna be m dr dt. And then next, I'm going to dot this with the derivative of, you know, my thing that's in the square with respect to time, which is d squared r dt squared, okay? I just very quickly applied the chain rule there. And what do you know? It's almost as if, in fact, it's exactly as if this guy here is exactly equal to what's in my red box up above, right? And so now we can rewrite out this integral again. Integral of t naught to t final dke dt dt. And of course, now that we're in this form, we can very clearly see that this is the delta in my kinetic energy. By integrating this, we're finding the change in our kinetic energy, right? So now you can see what we've done here, right? We've related our work done on our particle as it traveled through this path to the change in this parameter kinetic energy. And that, right, that is the work energy theorem. So let me go ahead and write this out nice and big. The work done on my particle from R0 to our final by taking this path C is equal to its change in kinetic energy, where kinetic energy, as we defined above, kinetic energy is defined as one half m, right, times effectively v squared, right? This is just your velocity right there. Okay, so let me go ahead and box this guy up. This guy here is our work energy theorem. All right, now let's go ahead and take this one step further. So this work here, okay, and I'm not going to write out all of this stuff now. I'm just going to write this as W is equal to change in kinetic energy, right? This work here 
This was a big kind of gross, you know, path integral of f dot dr. Ugh, I don't really want to calculate out this path integral every time if I don't have to, right? As physicists, we want to make our life easier where we can. So for certain force fields, right, we're probably going to be able to get away without having to take a path integral every single time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break this work term up into two terms. Work is going to be equal to work due to conservative forces plus work due to non-conservative forces. What is a conservative force? A conservative force is defined in the following way. It is defined if it can be written in terms of the gradient of a scalar potential u. And now u is purely a function of our spatial coordinates. That's really important for a conservative force. Okay, let's also note this, okay? Conservative forces, conservative force fields, they can change with spatial location, but not with time, right? Remember, we didn't specify anything about time earlier. We said it was totally fine for these forces when we came up with the work energy theorem. They could change in time before. Not if you're a conservative force, okay? Let's go ahead and see what happens if I plug in a conservative force in for my path integral. Then what I'm going to have is the work due to my conservative forces are going to be equal to, again, it's this path integral, but now I'm putting in this minus gradient of u dot dr. Now if I take the gradient of my potential energy and I dot it in some direction dr, that is going to tell me the infinitesimal change in my potential energy in that direction. And so then, by integrating all of those infinitesimal changes, we just have a minus delta u. Alright, so let me go ahead and just summarize here that the work due to a conservative force is going to be equal to the minus change in a potential energy. And so let's go ahead and put this all together here. So I have work due to non-conservative forces is equal to the change in my kinetic energy minus the work done due to my conservative forces. And now by plugging this in, this is going to be equal to the change in my kinetic energy plus the change in my potential energy. Let's also write this result super duper big. The work due to non-conservative forces is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of my particle plus its change in this new parameter which we've defined as the potential energy. And if we're able to show that all of the forces on my particle are conservative, that is, that they can be written in terms of a potential energy function, right? Then we determine that the work due to non-conservative forces is equal to zero for any path, and we have that the change in my kinetic energy plus the change in my potential energy is equal to zero, right? And this condition that we've stumbled across here is the law of conservation of energy, right? And effectively, all that we've done to get from the work energy theorem to the law of conservation of energy is we've added in this additional assumption that your forces are all conservative. That is, that they can be written in terms of this scalar potential energy U. Okay, so let me go ahead and box this guy up here. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this video here. This was a pretty thorough discussion on the work energy theorem for a single particle. Let me go ahead and emphasize one last idea here real quick. This guy here being a single particle, this is equivalent to a system of particles if your particles have no internal degrees of freedom. So for example, for a rigid body, if all of your particles can't move relative to each other and there's no rotation at play, then you can treat that system just like a simple little particle here. Okay, but of course, 
systems where you have rotation involved or you have internal degrees of freedom where you have to actually worry about the motion of the internal molecules, things are going to start to get a little bit more complicated, but we'll talk about that in the future. But anyways, if you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, let me know in the comments and consider subscribing to the channel. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.